Become a Therapist podcast plus listeners can listen to episodes early and ad free right now. Become a plus listener by going to Apple Podcasts, searching for the Trauma Therapist podcast, and signing up today. Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to thetraumatherapistproject.com. That's thetraumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. Very excited to have back Doreen Hills. Doreen, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. So Doreen is the founder, director at the Center for Healing Trauma and Attachment. Their mission is to provide cutting-edge treatment approaches in healing traumatic distress, and they're committed to finding ways to provide quality and affordable therapy and to be the pioneer in healing trauma in the Northeast region. Doreen has been a mental health provider for over 20 years and has worked in various settings in New York, Philippines, Colorado. Her background includes intense, immersed experiences working with poverty-stricken fishermen in the Philippines, orphans that were severely neglected and abandoned, as well as Muslims in India. Um, Doreen, we've We've had you here several times, and today we're going to talk kind of like a part two. Last time we were here, you um, shared your insights on the trauma-informed intake and what that means. So today we're going to do kind of a part two to that, which is really interesting. So take it away. Let bring us uh, up to speed. Yes, I think it's so important to really understand and have strategies in, you know, doing your intake. And again, you know, this this part here will really focus more on, you know, what what type of questions that clinicians can actually, you know, utilize. And these, you know, these questions, I've developed some of this and then some of that I derived on, you know, on the wisdom of Bessel van der Kolk and other trauma experts, and then just weaved it into my work. So I wanted to just kind of bring up this piece here where, you know, I think in the, in the E world, like the techie world, we tend to, you know, to just be, we get, we start to get comfortable with, you know, what is, what is, you know, those, what, what, what's offered to us. So let's say it's already lined up. It's easy. You know, clients can use that, which, you know, overall is pretty helpful. But then if we really wanted to understand attachment, um, you know, attachment between caregivers and even the generational attachment patterns and um, complex trauma we need to weave what, you know, what the words of wisdom from others have given us. And so I think it is important today to really dive into, you know, those strategies, those questions, and yet very mindful of the, you know, of the, of the person's story, not interrogative, you know, like a detective, you know, or not, okay. well, we're all detectives, but we're, you know, like not too, too much, not too interrogating. So I would love to share that with the listeners today. And um, I think to, I think I would like to focus on the adult version first, and maybe in the future, we can dive into the other versions. That sounds awesome. Okay. I love what you're saying here. So you're just, uh, in, in summary, in a sense, you're saying there's a lot of uh, online versions of, of intakes and you're, you're kind of suggesting or advising they're good and they have their place, but, but dot, dot, dot. Okay. So what are, what are some questions we're talking about here? 
Yes. And so I would like to start first with, you know, every time you see clients, you are a detective. You're trying to understand and learn their stories. So here we go, guys. I think, you know, pen and paper here and listen to the trauma therapist project to just get those information. So I would like to, you know, ask ask people, ask our clients, you know, the impact, the impact of the presenting issues on the relationship, uh, on their on their relationship within themselves, you know, and the immediate and extended family. So it is. I mean, you can weave it anytime when it's you know when it's that right time and right moment. I think it is important to not only focus on the symptoms, but also what is the impact of those in their relationship with others. Um, okay, so let's say you're asking me that question. Mm-hmm. What would you say? How how might you ask that? So I will ask you guy, okay, so you're saying that you're having a difficult time, you know, with anger or even having those flashbacks or even, you know, just the ability to connect with others. How is that impacting your relationship with your loved ones, with the people, with your coworkers? And, you know, I don't know how how you're going to respond to that, but that can be a very good, rich conversation as to, you know, the impact of those distress in someone's mm-hmm. system. Well, I would say um, it's impacting a lot. I mean, the, the flashbacks are uh, kind of interfering with my ability to, to communicate with my partner. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I don't know what's real and what's not. You know, I feel like I'm not even sometimes I feel like I'm not even here. Right. And so what a what a good conversation. And it it threads into, OK, are we dealing with, you know, is this something that the client would like to focus on their goals, you know, to be able to communicate, being, you know, communicate with my friends and loved ones in a present way, you know, being mindful so that you can you know, you can weave it in the, that goal, the goal or treatment planning. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes we have, I mean, our clients come to see us because their relationships are affected by trauma. And so I think it is important to understand, you know, get into the impact of it. Um, some of the things to, and again, this is more of the relationship with, you know, with their attachment figures, typically on the child, you know, on the childhood, on their childhood, who took care of you growing up? Who was your support system? Who was the one that you feel safe and secure with? Mm -hmm. And leave it as a really good conversation, you know, between the two of you. No, let me, let me, so why, we're kind of playing devil's advocate here. Why is that important? Why, why, I mean, we, you know, we know why trauma is important or attachment rather is important, but within this context, uh, why is that important to talk well, about? Let's, it is, it's very important. So let's say you are dealing with, with a client that has children and this gives us a, a good picture or maybe a snippet of, let's say I asked you that, I asked that question or I asked that question and the person said, I don't have any. I'm alone. I, or they might say, nobody is, you know, nobody is a safe person to me. So what happens is when they have that, you know, when they have that perception or that experience, how are they taking care of their kids? What kind of attachment style, you know, they kind of lean into, Mm -hmm. you know, is it disorganized? Is it Or is it ambivalent? Is it insecure attachment? So what, and oftentimes in complex trauma, it is the disruption between the child, the disruption, the disruption between the child and the caregiving system. So when we have a glimpse of what happened to them growing up, who took care of them, you know, it gives us an idea of what kind of attachment style they are running into or what, you know, what's blocking them, what's making them resilient, what makes them flourish. Or let's say who took care of you and they might say, well, I have aunts and uncles and grandpa and grandma that really, really love me. And do you still have connection with them? Absolutely. And how are they, you know, how are they playing in your in your role as as parents, as a parent now? I mean, boom, 
What a rich conversation. And you're getting an idea of, okay, here's this individual that has support system. And so when they're having a difficult time, they can run to those, to those folks. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It opens up a lot. It opens Uh, up a lot. Yeah. 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 Okay. Awesome. All right. Continuing on here. And another question, let's say. Yes. Another question, um, again, in the in in the context of that attachment is what was your parents, you know, what was your parents discipline style look like, Hmm. you know, and they might, well, they're pretty lax or some folks like, you know, some folks may say, well, they're authoritative, authoritarian. Um, They're very nurturing. Again, it's giving us a glimpse of what the attachment look like. And oftentimes when, let's say, as kids, we, you know, I mean, I came from I came from the Philippines and my parents were, you know, they're very strict. They're very, you know, they're very disciplinarian. And, you know, I kind of again in my in my caregiving system, I, you know, I default to that. Because that's what I've learned growing up. And so I have to tweak it. And, you know, there's pros and cons on that. So it gives, again, that kind of a question, how how your parents discipline, what is that like for you? How is that? Uh, how did that affect you before? And how is that affecting you now? Mm-hmm. You know, it gives us a picture of how they are in relation with their kids and, you know, with their, with their children. So that's really powerful. Now, in, in terms of... Some, you know, you're doing an intake in terms of someone who's experienced trauma. Let's say I'm the client and mm-hmm. you're asking me about my parents. Uh, uh, was it disciplinary style or how your, how your parents treated you? So moving along down that, that question line, what are you looking at in terms of how I'm experiencing my own trauma? What are you thinking about? in asking that question in terms of looking at how I'm dealing with my trauma? Yes, I'm, you know, I, I look at, I pay attention to the body language. I don't know if I answer your question, but I, you know, sometimes when we, again, how, how we, how we ask the questions. And again, it's, you know, very, very trauma sensitive um, care you know, paying attention to how the body is. So when they're sharing that with you, is there incongruency that's happening? You know, oh yeah, yeah, my, you know, my my dad beat me up. And then but this right, my- which a lot of people have that affect too when they when we talk about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that can be a very good, you know, a, a very good point for clinicians to not that time yet, but something to where they can they can they can pay attention they can make the client aware of it later on in sessions to where hmm i noticed that when you talk about you know about the stuff that you're smiling now you're looking into more of you know paying attention to i mean that sense of self awareness mm-hmm. you know so paying attention to the incongruency the congruency of the body as well as the affect can really, you know, get, it's really helpful when you are doing trauma-informed care. Mm, I love that. So it's in addition to kind of asking questions, there's also the observation Absolutely. Of, of what's going on too. Mm-hmm. Observation of the body language and, and so forth. Congruency, yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I noticed too, while we're talking, since we're talking about congruency, I noticed people will, you know, they will hunch or even their, you know, their shoulder starts to to tighten or even their, you know, I I call it the ballerina or the tippy toe, you know, your feet, you know, it feels like, okay, what is happening? And you can sense it. Do, Do we feel like we're getting flighty here? And I, when I sense that with clients or even sense that with me, okay, let's, and it's okay. This is something I want clinicians to remember. It is okay to pause and let them know, okay, I'm sensing a little bit of, you know, a little bit of 
um, something in me, you know, like we're feeling like we're getting disconnected. Are you mm-hmm. feeling that? And they might oftentimes they will, say, they will say, yeah, I think I need to take a little time out. Okay, so let's just take a moment. Let's plant our feet again. Let's take a deep breath. You and I doing this together, you know, so in that way they don't feel like, okay, well, you know, I'm I'm going crazy here because Doreen is not even participating with me. Nope, you're going to join them. Now you are going into the co-regulation and the attunement while you are understanding and learning their story. But then when they leave your office, the, the key to successful, I, I do believe the successful session is them leaving the office, your office regulated. Mm. Super important. So when you notice that, when you feel like their feet is kind of like they're doing the ballerina or the tippy toe, help them plant it again with you being there, with you mm-hmm. joining them. So there's so much going on. Oh, so much. I mean, there's so many different levels that you're operating on. You know, we we started out. Okay, we're going to talk about questions. Well, it's not just questions. There's so many things going on. One of the things that, you know, in speaking with you uh, on the many occasions that I have that I, I, I really admire about you, Doreen, is you just have this grounded sense and presence about you. Now, let me ask you this. When you're working with someone how much of you, your own experience do you share typically? Are you, and I, yes, it's different with every client and we want to do it ethically or with, with boundaries mm-hmm. and so forth. But is that something that you do? Typically, do you bring in your own experience of? You know, I, that's a beautiful question, Guy, because um, I ran into this um, just last week. And how I usually handle that, like that self-disclosure, again, right time and right moment. And your instinct will tell you, again, when you when you um, practice the sense of awareness and presence and just being attuned with them, your instinct will align with that. And so what happened to me last week was, you know, okay, oh, this, you know, the theme right now, I can share something. Now, what what's the most critical thing here to ask yourself is, is this going to benefit the client? Or this is just more of a, ra- you know, raging or, you know, not raging, but is it just more to share it? Mm-hmm. The biggest key here in self-disclosure is how is this going to benefit the client? And so, again, permission, I ask them, I have um, not too similar of a story with, you know, th- that you're sharing right now, but there's a theme that's kind of, you know, joining me with you. Can I share it? Is it okay? And it's not going to take too long. I'm talking about just a few seconds. And if they said, yes, sure, we would love to, I would love to hear that. And wow. then. Yeah. Does so- it make sense? Oh, it's, it's great. So what you're doing there is a couple of things, right? You're asking permission. And yes. what does that do? That gives them some control, some lets them know they're in, they're with you in a sense in that moment. Yes. Not just Doreen leading the session and, and it's, it's, you're asking permission, you're bringing them into the, the weight of the relationship in a sense. Yes. Always. And, you know, you and I talked about this on the first on the first episode that, OK, this ship is theirs. They they think that it's somebody's, you know, another captain has to run that ship. Right. My very first session is, no, you can be you are the captain of your ship. You know your story. I am just beside you. I'm just listening to what's happening. And so anything that I share with them Self-disclosure, again, it's for the service of the client. It has to be serving a purpose. Everything has to be intentional, not just, you know, I just wanted to share this because I want to. Nope. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're talking about here um, intake questions, generally for for adults, trauma-informed intake questions. Uh, 
Um, let's continue on. What other ones, what other questions uh, do you want to okay. point out? Oh, um, I also asked them, this is this is not something that's on just the typical intake, right? How do you handle stress? What do you do to take care of yourself? How do you cope with difficult emotions? Um, how effective are those tools? How is that working for you? How is that not working for you anymore? Um, what emotions do you find that's, you know, that, that are more difficult to manage? So it gives us an idea of how, you know, how they are in terms of coping skills and their calming strategies. I also, um, I also use this really cool tool. Um, you guys are you probably familiar with Captain America Shield, right? You know that you know it's all circle, and so it's it's got different you know different levels. And what I tell clients, and it can be the third session, it can be during the you know your nine zero eight three seven your your therapy session. Um, I ask them. Can you, you know, I do have the graph and you can do it yourself. You have a graph of that, you know, that, that, um, that shield. And I will tell them, can you show your, your support system using this graph, using this, um, using this tool? And so the closer they are, so in the middle, the closer those mm. per people are, you know, those are the ones that are close to their support system. And what you're doing there is understanding their tribe. And you might be surprised that you might be on the first, you know, on the first level, like, wow, you know, and what made you think, you know, adding me there now? Well, because I, I feel like I can trust you. I can talk mm -hmm. to you about stuff. So which is a very good way of now for folks that are doing EMDR, this is already you're, you're already introducing the resource installation here. You know, like the, those resource development, the RDI. So now these people, you know, the clients can identify he, here are the people that I feel safe and secure with. And most of them are probably, yeah, I like them, but, you know, they're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. So this is a powerful question that you can, you know, well, this is an inquiry, you know, to how many folks they have in their secure system. Wow. I love that one. That that can be uh, very re revealing too, because oftentimes, sometimes people can say, "Well, yeah, you know, my sister. I'm really close to my sister. Well, then why do you have her all the way out here?" Exactly. <laughs> well, I I just can't really tell her, share things with her, or whatever. She triggers me, or whatever. Exactly, and so it is. It's it's good to have that. Because they can tell you who are triggering. Yes, they're still support supportive, but they're triggering. But it's it's already giving you the idea, the template of okay, when we are doing those resourcing, we can include these figures, these people in their lives. So it's it's you know it's more than just a pen and paper or a computer between the two of you. You are right. already understanding their template, their story by just asking those sim simple and yet powerful questions. Right, right, right. And also, as you talked about, you know, maintaining this observation, watching their body language, watching yes. the con uh, congruency or incongruency. So very powerful. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And so utilizing, again, my suggestion to providers is be creative. Do not, you know, don't take creativity in your intake and in your sessions. You know, it, it is important to, it is important to use art. It is also important to, you know, bring the element of art. People tend to have a good idea when they're writing it in paper, when they can actually see it visually. You can use sand tray, you know, for those of you who, who are fascinated with sand tray, you can, you can do it in the second session or third session, even the first session, create your, you know, create your resource, your support system world. And they can create, you know, put objects that mean something to them. And so, we need to not only, again, we, we need not only to look at the symptoms and the problems, we also have to look into those 
positive resource system because eventually this is what this is what we wanted to do, right? That is the goal of trauma of trauma therapy is for healing and for recovery and for resiliency. And so you're already gathering this information. You may not use it right away, but you're putting it in, you're putting it in a box, in a very, you know, important box that once, oh, well, let's say a client might, I'm struggling right now. I don't know who can help me. Well, let's pull away. Let's take a moment here. How about your great aunt that's close close to you that she seems to be so dear in your heart that every time she just you hear her voice she just calms you ah i could not i didn't even think about her Mm -hmm. but you're it's more than intake it's more than paper you are already giving them because again you're giving you're the guide for them you're a witness and a guide for them like remember this time when you were you know when you're when you're having a difficult time this is the this is what you're telling me that you're good at this blah 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 you know personal strengths and resources do not forget to share or to ask those questions how do you get where you're at now mm-hmm. and i'll give you an example on this so you know how you're, let's say I'm asking you, you know, geez, you know, you, you've gone through so much adversities in life, you know, and it feels like it's, it's like all, all coming, you know, all at once, but there is also always that crack in the, you know, crack that like little slim crack there to where maybe a sign of hope, but what do you do to keep going? You know, you're here now, sitting with me, talking with me. So what is, you know, what, what are you, what, what get you where, where you're at? And they may take a moment and I tell them, take a moment to pause. I wanted you to just, to just kind of chew on these, you know, chew on this inquiry. And people might say, hope, I'm not giving up hope. Or they might say prayers, or they might say, I need, you know, walking, you know, this distance. So what's happening there, which is so beautiful, is you're, they're already giving you strategies, their ability to be resilient in difficult times, you know, or maybe they might say, I just remember my grandma and grandpa telling me to never give up. Mm-hmm. So when you're when when you're getting this information, you can use that when they're having a difficult time. Remember the time when you were telling me that you know you're not lose that you don't want to lose hope. How can we use this now for mm-hmm. you? And again, it's not those you you know the question is so gentle and at the same time you know, so in attuned to who are you as an individual? What an, um, you know, who are you as an individual? And it's not just question of what is your strength? What are the things that you're good at? It's not like those black and white. Right, right, right. Awesome. Three, Does that make sense though? It makes a lot of sense. It <laughs> makes a lot of sense. It's it's so inspiring to me. There's, there's a, you know, you uh, supervise clinicians also correct I do. With, and as we kind of wind down here i want to kind of close with this do you sense in younger clinicians is there a uh how are they fearful of interacting with people who've experienced trauma generally speaking um because what you're talking about here is kind of like a fearlessness it's a respect but it's a moving into their world and sometimes i mean a lot of times trauma can be frightening and i think for a newer clinician it can be scary even though they want to help of course yes so i i think it's that's the nature of and I've been there, you know, all of us been there. Like you're afraid if I ask this question, am I re-traumatizing them? Or if right, I ask right. something, something related to lethality or risk of suicide, am I going to, you know, to push them to do that? You know, and, and I think it is, here's, here's my take or my suggestions to new clinicians. Be open to asking questions 
your supervisor is there to help you. And if you feel like I need more, you know, again, from being fearful to fearless, you know, I, I think it is important for people to, to, for clinicians to ask and ask and ask, mm. seek supervision, seek, um, you know, like mentor, not shadowing, actually shadowing, shadowing providers that's been doing this over and over again and be okay to make mistakes. I mean, I've made mistakes many times, you know, when I was, when I was new. And so for us to, for us to, to be fear, fearless, we just have to practice it. And again, combining it with good supervision. Um, So oftentimes I think this is what's, and this is my experience. We get so caught up with the theories. We get so caught up with what we've learned in, you know, in the universities that this is just the black and the white. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it takes some time. So be forgiving of you, be kind to yourself. You know, I, I've learned to just ask questions. There are no stupid, there are no stupid questions. And I tell this to, to my, you know, to, to my supervisees, just ask me anything. And if I don't know, you and I are going to research it. (laughs) (laughs) So to, from become, from fearful to fearless, that's my, you know, that is my suggestion for, New clinic. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Doreen. Awesome. So what's the best way for people to reach you and learn more about what you're doing? Yes. So people can reach me um, you, uh, on our website. It's uh, chtainc.org, or they can give us a call at 970-397-4609. Okay, we'll have that linked up at the show notes page here at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Doreen, always awesome and inspiring talking to you. Um, we'll have you back. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, take care.